In the last video, we introduced vectors, which can be thought of as arrows in space. We talked about how vectors have two important properties, their length and their orientation. In this video, we will focus on the length of vectors. We will first try to understand the operation of finding the length of a vector, and once we have figured that out, we will move on to changing the length of a vector, or scaling. This video is a part of From Zero to Geo, a series where we formulate geometric algebra, an incredibly powerful branch of mathematics, from the ground up. So how do we find the length of a vector? We said that the length is represented by a positive number, but what number should it be? As it is, we currently don't have enough information to determine the length. The issue is that we have no units to work with. Usually, when you need to find the length of a vector, the vector will be in some coordinate system, and then we can use that coordinate system to find the length. You'll figure out exactly how to do this calculation later, but with this coordinate system, the length of this vector is about 3.6. Now, it can be a bit annoying to describe the length of a vector in an equation using words like we did here. It would be helpful to have some kind of notation for the length of a vector. But what notation should we use? Let's look at something that we already know about, numbers. Is there some way we can make sense of the length of a number? For example, what's the length of 2? Well, the only number that really seems to fit would be 2 itself. We can also think of this as saying that 2 is the distance between 0 and 2. In fact, we could think of the vector going from 0 to 2, and the length of this vector is 2. We can say then that the length of any number is the length of the vector going from 0 to that number. For example, the length of 4 is 4. But what about the length of a negative number, like negative 3? Well, the length of the vector going from 0 to negative 3 is 3, so the length of negative 3 is 3. In general, we see that the length of any positive number is that number and the length of any negative number is the positive version of that number. Wait a minute, this is just the absolute value. In general, the length of a number x is simply the absolute value of x. Because of this correspondence between length and absolute value, let's write the length of a vector using the same notation. This method of associating vectors on a line with numbers is very useful when trying to figure out the properties of vectors. We will be using it several times in the future. Just so you know, some people like to differentiate between the length of a vector and the absolute value of a number, so they write the length of a vector with two vertical bars on each side instead of just one. However, in geometric algebra, we will figure out that they really are the same thing, so I will use the notation that looks like the absolute value. Let's do an exercise. Here are a bunch of vectors. What is the length of each of these vectors? Please pause the video and try to answer this question. So, the first vector should be easy. It is along the x-axis, and you can see that it ends at 3, so the length is 3. The second vector is very similar, but there is one thing that might trip you up. You can see that the vector is along the y-axis and that it ends at negative 2 so you might say that the length is negative 2. However, length is a positive quantity, so the actual length is just 2. The third vector is a bit harder, because it doesn't start at 0. You can see that its end is at negative 3, but its start is at negative 2, making its length 1. It's with the fourth vector that things start to get interesting. This vector isn't parallel to an axis so we can't figure out the result easily. What can we do here? Well, we can make a right triangle with this vector where the other two sides are along the axes. We know that the lengths of these two sides are 4 and 3, and then we can use the Pythagorean theorem to find the length of the vector. Thus, the length of this vector is 5. Finally. This last vector is similar to the previous one. We can make a right triangle and use the Pythagorean theorem to find the length.
we see that the length is 2 times the square root of 2. If you were wondering why they taught you the Pythagorean theorem at school, finding the length of a vector is one of its most important applications. Let's consider two special lengths a vector can have, 0 and 1. What does it mean for a vector to have a length of 0? We think of vectors as arrows, which are oriented line segments. Can you even have a line segment with a length of 0? Well, I guess you could have a point, but is that really a vector? To figure this out, let's think back to why we care about vectors in the first place. Remember that we were using vectors to represent points in space. We would represent some point by thinking of the vector from the origin to that point. Notice that the length of each of these vectors is the distance from the origin to the point the vector represents. So do any of these vectors have a length of zero? We can rephrase this question as asking if there are any points that are a distance of zero away from the origin. Well, the origin itself has a distance of zero away from the origin. Thus, if we want to be able to represent the origin using a vector, we need to have a vector with a length of zero. In fact, the distance between every other point on the plane and the origin is greater than zero, meaning that this is the only vector with a length of zero. Let's call this vector with a length of zero the zero vector, and write it with the symbol for zero but as a vector. As we'll see later, the zero vector plays a similar role to the number zero in many equations. In fact, in geometric algebra, it turns out that the number zero and the vector zero are the same thing. However, at the moment, we are actually doing linear algebra, not geometric algebra, so we have to distinguish between the two. We know the zero vector has a length of zero, but what's the orientation of the zero vector? We think of the orientation as the direction the vector is going, but the zero vector doesn't really go anywhere. Thus, let's just say that the zero vector has no orientation. So what about a vector with a length of 1? Vectors with a length of 1 are not as weird as the zero vector, but they are still pretty useful. Let's call vectors with a length of 1 unit vectors. To distinguish unit vectors from other vectors, instead of writing the vector with the arrow above it, we will instead write the vector with a circumflex which we usually just call a hat. We read it as v hat, so the equation on the right says that the length of v hat is 1. In general, if a hat is on a symbol, that means that it is a unit vector. That's pretty much it for finding the length of vectors, at least for now. Let's now move on to changing the length of vectors, or scaling. Let's start with this vector and double its length. What should we call this new vector? We want to find some way to write this operation of doubling the length, but how should we do it? Let's look at the correspondence between these vectors and numbers as I suggested earlier. The number associated with v is 3, and the number associated with the scaled vector is 6. We see that scaling the vector by a factor of 2 corresponds with multiplying by 2. Thus, Scaling is similar to multiplication, so let's call the scaled vector 2 times v. In general, let's define multiplication between a number and a vector to mean scaling the vector by that number. Because numbers can be used to represent scaling, we will call numbers scalars. Even though we are calling them by a different name, scalars are just numbers. To differentiate between the different kinds of multiplication, Let's call this multiplication between scalars and vectors scalar multiplication. One interesting thing to note is that with normal multiplication, we take two numbers and get another number in return. However, with scalar multiplication, we take a number and a vector and get a vector in return. We see that scalar multiplication involves different objects, whereas normal multiplication does not. It's important to remember this difference, so keep it in mind. However, like many other things, we will later learn that normal multiplication and scalar multiplication are special cases of a more general product where this distinction is less important. For now, though, 
we need to keep them separate. Multiplying a vector by a positive number makes sense now, but what about multiplying by a negative number, such as negative 2? Well, the vector is represented here by the number 3, and 3 times negative 2 is negative 6, so the vector here is negative 2 times b. In general, multiplying a vector by a negative number flips the vector so that it faces the other way. Now, you might be getting mad at me, saying, Hey, I thought you said that scaling doesn't change the orientation of a vector. But now you are saying that scaling by a negative number flips the vector to point the other way. Let's make an analogy to try to make it clearer why this makes sense. When talking about the natural numbers, the sum of two numbers is always greater than or equal to each individual number. You can try any two natural numbers, and no matter what, these inequalities are true. However, while this is true for the natural numbers, it is not true once we bring negative numbers into the mix. The property that we initially saw, the fact that the whole is greater than the parts, seems like an essential fact of addition. However, when we extended it to negative numbers, that property was lost. It's the same with scalar multiplication. It initially seemed like the fact that scaling a vector doesn't change its orientation was an essential fact about scalar multiplication. However, when we extended it to negative numbers, that property was lost. And it's not like it was completely lost. Scaling a vector still always leaves it on the same line, even if its direction can be reversed. Now that we've got all of that out of the way, let's do another exercise to make sure you understand how scaling works. Here are the same vectors from the previous exercise. Find each of these scaled vectors. You may think it's hard to find a vector when you aren't using the animation tools that I'm using. You have several options here. For one, you could redraw this picture on your own paper and then draw the scaled vectors yourself. Another option is to find the coordinates of the start and end of the scaled vectors. Anyway, please pause the video and solve this. Let's go through these in order. First, we need to find 2 times v1. v1 goes from 0 to 3, so doubling this means that 2 times v1 goes from 0 to 6. Next, we need to find 1 half times v2. This time, the vector gets smaller because we are scaling it by a half. It originally went down to negative 2, but when that is cut in half, it instead goes to negative 1. The next vector to find is negative 3 times v3. This time we are multiplying by a negative number. It originally goes 1 to the left, so now it needs to go 3 to the right. Now to find 0 times v4. This one is a bit different. Any number times 0 is 0, so the length of 0 times v4 is 0. This means that the result is the 0 vector. Finally, we need to find 3 halves times v5. Multiplying by a fraction like this can be confusing at times. We can do this by first scaling it down by a half and then scaling it up by 3, making for a total scaling of 3 halves. Great, so we now know how to multiply vectors by scalars. But wait, what about adding them? And what about adding and multiplying vectors by each other? We'll get to all of these eventually. In fact, in the next video, we are going to figure out what it means to add two vectors. Before you watch it, see if you can figure out what vector addition should be yourself.